Studying for exams is stressful and isolating, and it's easy to think that you're the only one who's struggling. Today, let's walk through 50, that's right, 50, study tips for exams. And I'm gonna try and do this all in 15 minutes. Editor Jack here. I definitely went over the 15 minute limit. The schmuck talking on screen doesn't know that he's talking too slow, even though I talk very fast. Bear with me, we'll be over by this much time. We'll be over soon. If it's your first time here, my name is Jack Wayne. I'm a microbiologist, science educator, and in 2020, I was named the Australian University Teacher of the Year. On this channel, we talk about how university students, and by extension, their professors and teachers, learn, and how this shared experience shapes all of our careers moving forward. At the time I'm publishing this video, it's November or exam season in Australian universities. We'll be organizing the information using Bloom's taxonomy, a hierarchy of learning complexity with remembering being the simplest all the way down the bottom. Broader awareness of the higher levels of learning with constructing new understanding all the way at the top of Bloom's taxonomy will help you better achieve the lower levels of learning as well. Tip one, the outline method. Use the learning objectives for each class as your main headings. During class, write your notes under the right heading. Then after class, reorganize these concepts into more refined subheadings. There is however the temptation to leave your notes as a transcript of everything the teacher said. So when you're revising, it can be hard to figure out what's most important. Tip two, the Cornell method, which makes your interrogation of the information more explicit. Divide your page into three columns, notes, important ideas mentioned during class, cues, questions you may have from the material, and summary, your distillation of the overall objective of that class. These three columns reinforce the idea that note taking is not a one and done activity. Before class, during class, and after class all need you to reflect constantly on the information. Tip three, mind maps which are compatible with both the outline and Cornell note-taking methods. Each concept is a node which needs to be joined to other nodes through relationships. Your notes will end up looking like a tree with branching sets of connections between each related piece of information. Unless you're quite experienced, it's hard to do this live during class. Probably best as an after-class activity to build upon your outline. Tip four, speed is everything. You wanna develop shorthand and abbreviations for common terms so that it's quicker to write and easier to read. Use the first few letters of the word, for example, or remove vowels, make use of common symbols and abbreviations. Tip five, but speed is almost everything. Mix and match longhand and shorthand note-taking and try to avoid specialized boutique symbols that only you know about in that moment because odds are you'll forget what they are come crunch time. Tip six, the power of PowerPoint. The slides are mostly filled with text that professors have written themselves. So take us at our word. Don't rewrite everything, but instead annotate, underline, and draw arrows under the existing text during class. And then you can focus more on listening and processing the information rather than just transcribing on the day. Tip seven, not quite gospel. Don't try to transcribe everything the lecturer says or watch lecture recordings a hundred times, because if you do this, you're still trying to passively absorb the information without processing it. Tip eight, the second pass through. After you take notes live in class for the first time, you should revisit those notes within 24 hours and summarize them again. Any key points or questions you had, make sure you try to address them at or before the next class. Tip nine, the third pass through. A week after class, your note summary is a broader reflective exercise. Read through your first, second, pass-throughs and try to summarize everything again. It's this constant interaction and revisiting of your notes that will help secure it into your long-term memory. Tip 10, pick your poison. Handwritten or typed notes. Handwriting tends to be more selective and you're processing as you're writing because your hands get tired writing things out by hand. Typing tends to be a little less effort and more mindless, so at the end, it might look more like a transcript of everything the lecturer said. Well, there's no right or wrong way. Whichever method encourages you to revisit the notes and refine them over and over again will work just fine. Tip 11, best of both worlds. Some students have taken to writing notes with a stylus and tablet combo, which has the benefit of the physical act of handwriting with the convenience of digital. Tip 12, plain tag. The other benefit of digital, of course, is that you can group digital files into categories or folders with labels, keywords, tags, or colors. Come revision time, you can filter your notes whichever way you like, and build custom revision learning activities based on what is being assessed. How much actually helps you remember? Now, no, I didn't say help you learn. This is specifically to do with remembering or memory, which on Bloom's taxonomy is the lowest, simplest form of learning. If we do just wanna focus on memorizing though, what's the most effective way? Active recall, 
and spaced repetition. Our brains are more likely to retain information when it's trying to retrieve it or recall it. So doing practice exams is the right kind of exercise that nurtures long-term memory. You need to repeatedly do the same questions again and again to slow down the forgetting curve, only stopping for the moment once you find the topic to be too easy. You then focus on the harder topics and space at the time between repeating the same topic, depending on how difficult you find the material to be at that moment in time. You've heard about all of this before, it's all over YouTube. So instead let's talk about how to put it into action. Tip 13, use flashcards. Questions on the front, answers on the back. If you get the answer right, you put the card in the easy pile. If you get the answer wrong, put the question in the hard pile. Revise the easy pile once a week, revise the hard pile once a day. Tip 14, sharing is caring. Share your flashcards with your friends because writing questions, finding answers, and making the cards is very time consuming. So if you can make it a group activity that saves everyone, including yourself, some time. Tip 15, consider digital flashcards. Anki is the most popular app for this where you can keep the flashcards on your phone so you can test yourself anywhere, anytime, and it also shows you the questions on order based upon when you answered it correctly last. So it's very convenient for built-in spaced repetition. Tip 16, live in the past. Take all the questions you can find from past exams and any relevant parts of the textbook and make each one into a flashcard. This way you can be sure that what you're revising aligns with at least what your professor has tested in the past. Tip 17, the previous tip assumes that you have answers to your past exams, which is a big assumption. So before you start anything, you'll need to form a study group to figure out the answers collaboratively for making your flashcards. Tip 18, don't ask teachers for answers because no teacher wants the answers to their exams leaking online. Try to work out the answers by yourself first and then show it to your teachers to ask for feedback. That's much more productive. Tip 19, convert multiple choice into short answer questions. Normally each multiple choice question has at least four wrong options or distractors and one correct answer. For each of the four distractors, convert it into a short answer question for a flashcard. What's wrong with this option? Is this statement true or false? Can you explain why? Tip 20, swap out key terms in short answer questions and use this to write your own practice questions. For example, if the question is asking you about infections caused by one type of bacteria, swap it out for a different bacteria and try to answer it again. Tip 21, boredom is your worst enemy when it comes to revision. So you need fresh ways of looking at the same material. Saying the answer out aloud, writing it out on paper, typing it on your computer, anything to keep it fresh. Tip 22, strength in numbers. Revise with a friend or a study group online or in person and let your study group keep you accountable and collectively form some good study habits that sets you all up for the long term. Tip 23, a taxonomic audit. So using Bloom's taxonomy, go through all the revision questions in your custom test bank. How many of these are just asking you to define and list things? Because that's raw memorization. So active recall and space repetition and flashcards they will work just fine. Tip 24, an issue of complexity, because if most of your test bank comes from past exams, your auditor should find that many of them are asking you to explain, describe, compare, and contrast, not just define or list. This is no longer memorizing, but higher up on Bloom's taxonomy, understand, apply, evaluate. You'll need new strategies that can establish connections and relationships between the concepts you learn. Tip 25, mind the gap. All the way back in tip three, you learn how to make mind maps that connect the dots between related concepts on a specific topic. Try to remove a node or a branch or a connection and put that incomplete mind map on a flashcard. Answering that question now doesn't rely on pure memorizing of one idea because you need to know how all the pieces fit and how everything's connected to get it right. Tip 26, mix and match. If questions are asking you to compare and contrast two different concepts, Draw a table where each row is comparing similar but different attributes. Remove one term, swap it out with another, put the right term in the wrong place. With just a little bit of extra effort, you can start to build in higher order reasoning into your revision, not just memorize. Tip 27, the Feynman technique or trying to explain a concept to other people. Can you critique people in your study group's explanations of the same concept and add to them constructively because this moves you past remembering or memorizing and more into understanding, explaining or describing higher up on Bloom's taxonomy. Tip 28, explain it to yourself. Film or record yourself explaining a difficult concept from memory, from scratch. Do this again and again until you're happy with the recording, showing your complete explanation to your whole study group. Watching and listening to yourself can be a very cringy experience. You can take it from me. So you can also improve your communication skills at the same time. Tip 29, explain it to an outsider. Find a person who doesn't know anything about what you're studying, a friend, a family member, and see if they have any idea what on earth you're talking about. To do this, you'll need to adapt your explanation for different audiences, 
avoid using technical jargon and explain things without making assumptions about what they know. This is again, higher up on Bloom's taxonomy, applying and using information in new contexts. Tip 30, the setting matters. Where are you doing your revision and how similar will it be to the final exam venue? If there's noise or it's very hot or very cold in the exam venue, that will add to the anxiety on the day if you're not used to that environment. So try to replicate your exam location, reproduce it in small but measurable ways. Now you've done everything you can, notes, revision questions, flashcards, so it's game time, exam day. Let's break down some exam taking strategies depending on the type of question you're answering, starting of course with multiple choice questions or MCQs. Tip 31, red herrings. Read the question stem clearly and don't start by reading the distractors because they're designed to distract you. So read the question stem and think about the key terms, block out all the distractors and try to recall what you already know about it. Then you can read all of the answer options. Tip 32, cheap tricks. Check if the question stem is asking for true or false not true or not false options, and don't be fooled by double negatives. It's really very poor practice for teachers writing these types of questions, but you don't have to fall for these cheap tricks. Tip 33, generalities. Look through answer options with never and always. These tend to be wrong because there's just less chance that things are more universal that way. So read through those options first and be confident crossing them off your list. Tip 34, the process of elimination. It's easier logically to find out why answers are wrong, then finding all the reasons that an answer is right. There's also great validation and crossing out wrong answers, momentum and being active, rather than being paralyzed by uncertainty. Tip 35, devils in the details. How different do the answer options look to each other? If there are any options that look similar to each other with one key difference, that may hide a clue for the real answer. Tip 36, is there a penalty for getting an answer wrong other than losing the mark? If not okay to guess, don't leave any questions unanswered, but it's not great practice. There is value though in tip 37, productive failure. If it's one question that you get wrong, it's just one question. Still have a go and stay in the moment. Don't let one short term loss or failure derail your constructive mindset for the rest of the exam. Tip 38, divide and conquer. How many minutes should you spend on one single question? Divide the number of marks by the total time of the exam and work it out. Often it's one mark per minute. So for an MCQ is no more than two or three minutes per mark. Tip 39, middle ground or lack thereof. Despite what you've heard, there's no bias towards selecting option C or the middle option as being the correct answer. Most online exam platforms now randomize the answer option order anyway, so don't overthink it. Moving on now to short answer, problem solving or essay style questions. Tip 40, underlying key terms in the question stem and don't rush. Do some thinking first about what you already know about these key terms. Plan out your answer logically point by point before you start writing. Tip 41, summaries matter. Cover all of the main points in your opening sentence to show the marker a preview of what your answer will be and that you've got a broad understanding of the topic. All the summarization that you've done in your notes up to that point, first, second, third pass throughs will help with this tactic. Tip 42, know your medium. Unless otherwise stated, Dot points are perfectly fine and quicker for markers to mark and read and quicker for you to write. But this is mostly relevant for short answer questions, usually worth between two to five marks. Tip 43, again, know your medium. If it's an essay style or problem solving question, then you're being assessed on how you can construct a cohesive piece of argumentative writing. Dot points won't work here and you'll need headings, subheadings, topic sentences, summaries, conclusions, you need to know your medium. Tip 44, back to the drawing board. For essays or problem solving questions, simple revision questions in your test bank won't work. The answers to open-ended philosophical topics or scenarios won't be one word answers that can fit on a flashcard. It's much higher up on Bloom's taxonomy. We need to apply, analyze, and evaluate. Tip 45, plug and play. If your problem solving question involves calculations, for example, there's not an infinite number of scenarios. You'll most likely have seen all of the derivatives of that question by going through past exams. What changes then, and what's easy to change, is the numbers associated with that calculation because teachers can swap these out and plug and play very quickly. There's no reason why you can't do the same and create an infinite pool of practice questions just by changing the numbers. Tip 46, data. A common template for problem solving involves looking at and trying to interpret a graph. This is not that easy to convert into a flashcard, so the way to get reps is to try and spot the patterns. What's on the X and Y axes? How does one change in relationship to the other? Does one go up when the other goes down or vice versa? And how much time has elapsed? Tip 47, 
look to the literature. Research articles are the primary source of complex graphs and data, so use Google Scholar strategically. Find a research article published in the last five years on your topic and see if you can figure out the first piece of data and what it's trying to say. Odds are you won't be able to fully make sense of it, but again, you're looking for patterns and heuristics. The axes, the relationships, the trends, the changes over time, and that's how you get your reps. And we're officially past the 15 minute mark. Apologies, not many tips left now. Everything's bookmarked, so you can skip through it quickly if you'd like. Bear with me a little longer. Tip 48, natural limits. The same philosophy applies for essay topics. Could there really be an infinite number of topics your teacher can ask you to respond to? Odds are it's a subtle variation on the same things you've been exploring over the semester. So you should build up a test bank of practice essay questions as well, each of which you've responded to and written out multiple times. Similar opening arguments, interconnected details, multiple ways of demonstrating your understanding of the same key concepts and evaluating how they compare to each other. Let's say you do this 10 times, have 10 different practice essays you've written out. What are the odds that the real exam would have some overlap with one of these essays? Tip 49, muscle memory. Do your practice and revision in the same way as you'll be completing the exam. If it's handwritten on paper, revise by writing things on paper. If it's an online exam, practice by typing things out. Build up your reps and take one more variable out of the equation on exam day. Tip 50, finale. How do we achieve learning all the way on top of Bloom's taxonomy, constructing new knowledge or understanding? The good news is that it's almost impossible to do this through the vehicle of written exams alone. So your teachers shouldn't be expecting you to do this. This is normally reserved for research projects, internships, or experiences which are transformative learning activities that we will talk more about in a future video. We did it 50 study tips in roughly 15 minutes. I'm almost certainly gonna go over. Yep, you certainly did. And don't be too hard on yourself if you miss a day or have an unproductive session. Stay in a moment, do the best you can. This is the Bell App Collective, I'm Jack Wayne. Good luck.